Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 725 of the podcast and it is Saturday the 25th of November 2023 as I record this. In today's show I'm talking to Michael Evans about subscriptions, the business and mindset shifts around selling direct, why trust is the heart of an author's business, the creator economy and how fiction authors in particular could use Ream as part of their ecosystem. As a young founder and author, Michael is also part of the future of publishing, so I'm thrilled to talk to him about where he sees things going over the next decade. I know you'll find our conversation interesting, so that's coming up in the interview section. So in publishing and book marketing things, the self-publishing advice podcast from the Alliance of Independent Authors has a show on successful marketing for multi-genre authors this week with Dale L. Roberts and Holly Greenland. And it's really interesting. And Holly includes stats from a survey saying only around 30% of indie authors in the survey, obviously, write in only one genre. And I love hearing that as so often we hear advice to stick to one genre. Never from me, of course, as I've never done that. (laughs) Now, Holly's survey shows the average author writes in two or three genres, but some go up to 15. So I was challenged by that and I was like, okay, so uh, what genres have I written in? And we'll we'll just take genre as categories uh, on Amazon. So I've written in career development, public speaking, writing craft, marketing, small business, creativity and psychology, as well as action adventure thrillers, fantasy action adventure, crime, horror, travel memoir and short stories. (laughs) Short stories is actually a separate category on Amazon. So I'm up to around 12 uh, with definitely more to come. I've mentioned my book on Gothic cathedrals, hopefully coming in 2024, and that will go in architecture. (laughs) I've always wanted to write an architecture book, so I'm pretty excited about that. But it might end up being a bit like the shadow book, which is I'll be talking about it for years before I actually finish it. But hey, got to have something to aim for. So back to the self-publishing advice podcast episode. So they go into your author brand and of course the difficulties of having a consistent brand when you write in so many genres and the pros and cons of separating author names and email lists, both, you know, the good reasons. So for me, I'm really happy to have Joanna Penn and JF Penn. Um, I don't separate more on that. Although with direct sales, it's been much easier to tag people by books that they have bought. So I know uh, what people have bought and what format and all of that. So that's interesting data. Uh, You can also make subgenres clear by genre, which is kind of what I do for JF Pen. My series all look different. Holly and Dale also go into the challenges of email lists as well as how to manage different channels on social media and basically not doing everything on every platform. So definitely check that out. And that same podcast feed has inspirational indie author interviews, self-publishing news, episodes on crowdfunding, Q&A sessions like whether to set up an author imprint, which is a question a lot of people email me and I always send people over to self-publishing advice, as well as my sessions with Orna Ross are all in that feed. So just search for self-publishing advice on your uh, podcast app. I've also just finished two quite different books that made me think. So first, Same As Ever, Timeless Lessons on Risk, Opportunity and Living a Good Life by Morgan Housel. So I listened to the audiobook on Spotify and also then bought the paperback for rereading and making notes. And I think it's my book of the year. (laughs) It's about long term thinking, which is definitely something I think about at this time of year and is especially important in a time of accelerating change. So you might say, but Joe, you're always thinking about the future and encouraging us to think of how things will change. Well, yes, you're allowed to think of change and what stays the same. <laughs> it's not one or the other. It is a balance. So, for example, and I, I'm going to keep talking about this now. As this is, I used to do long distance walking and ultra marathons and things, but now I am heavily... <laughs> 
into weightlifting. So I lift weights twice a week now, and this is much better for um, perimenopause, postmenopause women. Um, and the benefits now are physical and mental health. So I feel really good when I lift. I feel strong. I feel better about my body. So that's the now, but it's also to build my old lady body. <laughs> As loss of strength for women, postmenopause is a real thing. Breaking bones is much more common for older women. So I lift weights for now and for later. And I guess it's the same, I mean, with writing. We write for now because we love it. We're also writing for later as we're building a body of work. And great advice for investing. And Morgan Housel's first book, The Psychology of Money, is also excellent. Um, also for business practices, this book is really, really good. So please buy Same As Ever. And if you haven't read The Psychology of Money, both of these books should be on your reading list in terms of business books and things that we can underpin our indie author business with, as well as a life. Um, how little things can compound into extraordinary things. Again, for every dollar invested, for every hundred words written, that kind of thing. And also when things don't scale, I particularly enjoyed the chapters in Same As ever around how some things don't scale. So my business really doesn't scale. I'm as one single person, I'm never going to be able to build a massive, massive business. To build a massive, massive business, you need employees, you need bigger infrastructure, but that's not what I'm building. Uh, so it's really good to think about that. And if you compare yourself to someone else, think about how they've structured their business to enable them to scale. And is that what you really want? Uh, the other things, how it's supposed to be hard and that everything worth pursuing comes with a little pain. The trick is not minding that it hurts. And again, I think about that with my weightlifting, having done some pretty big lifts this week. So yes, it's a great book. I'll be rereading it more slowly and definitely re-listening. Um, so, and also what this also made me think is in terms of marketing. So I bought the book, as I heard the first 15 minutes of an interview on the Prof G podcast with Scott Galloway, which is a podcast I enjoy, I stopped the interview with, Mo he was interviewing Morgan Housel about the book. I stopped the interview, clicked over to the audio book on Spotify and started listening immediately. It's part of the premium um as part of my subscription. And then I bought the paperback before I'd even finished the audiobook, as I knew I wanted a copy. I've recommended it to friends by email. I've also recommended it to you, which is potentially 20,000 people. <laughs> I will also gift it this Christmas. So I'm not on Morgan's email list. I'm not on his publisher's email list. I don't even know who his publisher is. But having read The Psychology of Money, having rated him in my mind as an author I think is good, um, I was willing to listen to the podcast. Also, it was on a podcast I already listened to. And then I went over and bought the book. So I bought based on a podcast interview and I bought in multiple formats. So what does that tell you about book marketing? And how could you incorporate aspects of that discoverability in your ecosystem? And I also wanted to talk about the other book I finished, which was Year of the Locust by Terry Hayes, which is a very long espionage terrorist thriller. Now, some of you might also have read this this week, and some of you might remember his first book. So this was only his second book. Uh, his first book, I Am Pilgrim, was a huge hit. It's traditionally published again, but a huge hit back in 2013. So it's been a decade since his last book. So I Am Pilgrim, I read at the time, it was everywhere, it was in all the bookshops. So I read it, I, I enjoyed it. Um, after that finished Somehow I heard about the next book, maybe it was an Amazon recommendation, and I pre-ordered it. That pre-order has been cancelled five or six times over the last decade. So it is years overdue at this point. And if you, uh, if, you know, I went and had a look and lots of people commenting on whether it's worth the wait. Now, again, I'm not on Terry's email list. I don't know anything about him other than I enjoyed that first book, uh, which was very, very long and again, this is an interesting thing about some of these very, very long books uh, is that 
if it makes them more memorable in a way. So reading one of his very long books was probably the same as reading five of my shorter thrillers. Uh, and I know if people do read five books in my Arcane series, they pretty much go on to read everything. Um, but it's that, so that made me think, um, but also very think, it made me think around considering the author, the point of being an author in mind. We want to craft brilliant books that are quality and memorable books of whatever genre. And look, I think it's just because we're coming into the holiday period and also post 20 Books Vegas, when you look at your list of things to do or just in general as an author, there are so many things that you could be doing around the tools and the marketing and the publishing. But at heart, this is about creating something only we can do, each of us individually. So if you don't have an email list or a website or you aren't doing any marketing or you don't do any active social media or you don't do video, you don't do podcasting, maybe you're not doing any of that. But if you're focusing on a quality book, the best it can be, and that might take a bit longer to create something amazing, then that is a good place to start. And that's what I'm thinking as I move into next year, because I already do have a lot of those things. But what it comes down to is, am I writing something that is memorable? Am I writing something that is stands for the longer term, as I feel both of these books that I'm recommending do? So and that it kind of relates to the AI stuff as well. Again, I've never been in the rapid release and create it using AI tools to create books faster and faster. That is not what I do. What I'm using is using AI tools to make things deeper. So I'm writing this short story at the moment beneath the zoo. The finished story is only going to be less than 5,000 words. Um, But what I'm doing is using ChatGPT at the moment to help me make it deeper. Um, Sort of going back over sentences and saying, okay, so how could I make this stronger? How could I make this resonate with elements of this particular mythology or elements of this particular creature? I don't want to tell you too much about the story, but um, how could I ma- how could I bring in language that subconsciously makes the reader think this? And so I'm using it very much as a creative partner to make my work richer and stronger. Um, yeah, so everything is in service of my creative vision to create useful and inspirational non-fiction books and fiction that helps you escape. And so I wanted to mention those things to help you take a breath as we move into December, the month of December. I certainly know that it is a a slower month for me um, in many ways and I take more time to think about things and read and all of that. So you can focus on your excellent ideas. Think about what you want to create in 2024. And when you look at your to-do list, maybe just get rid of a whole load of things and put right, really amazing book (laughs) back at the top. (laughs) And yes, you do need to do some of the other stuff, but the work and the creative vision comes first. So I hope that helps you take a breath this December. Now, of course, even as some things stay the same, the world doesn't stop while we take a breath. And in fact, the last week, has, if you've followed, been following the AI news, the, it has been pretty chaotic at OpenAI, if you uh, have been following. But now it seems to have levelled out so we can crack on with getting on with using the tools. Um, personally, I am loving ChatGPT Pro at the moment because um, of using Dolly within chat uh, and also the, the tech stuff. I still use Midjourney. I still use Claude. And if you're in the pa- Patreon community, in my Patreon community, you'll have the various tutorials already there, more to come. But it's also time for another webinar. My bandwidth is stretched. And as I said, I'm trying to sort of take a bit more of a break. So I'm thrilled that Joseph Michael is doing a webinar for my audience on how to use AI tools to unleash your creativity and be more productive. So this will go through some basics, but also some advanced stuff. And I'm looking forward to it personally, because I feel like there are so many different ways to use these tools. And I always like to watch other people using them. So this webinar will be on the 5th of December. It is free. You can find more details and register at the creative pen com forward slash DEC5. So that's short for December 5th. So thecreativepen.com forward slash DEC5 links in the show notes. I'll start by outlining my current processes. Then Joe will demo chat GPT, including the free version. So um, you don't have to 
pay for anything uh, for this webinar. Um, the best ways to use prompts, avoid common mistakes and how to craft a piece of writing from scratch. So Joe, uh, Joe and I used to do webinars on Learn Scrivener Fast and Joe is super organised, structured, very good at teaching and <laughs> uh, whereas I'm all about taming chaos and kind of jumping around and moving, moving fast and splashing around and trying things out. So we're quite different. Uh, so if you'd like to join Joe and I, that is 5th of December 2023, 3 p.m. US Eastern, 8 p.m. UK. You can register for your free place or get the replay, thecreativepen.com forward slash DEC5. And yes, it is a free webinar. Joe does have a course on writing with chat and I'm an affiliate, but you don't need to buy anything. You can just come along, hang out with us, learn about how to use uh, chat GPT, whether you already use it or you're AI curious. So in personal news, I've, I'm working on a number of things. I finally, finally narrated the short story, A Midwinter Sacrifice, which I first wrote in 2015 when we moved to Bath. Uh, it's inspired by the Bath Christmas Market. And I published it a few years ago, after, so during the pandemic, really. And then the audiobook narration has been waiting. And then Christmas passes and another year begins. And I just don't feel like doing it. But it's Christmas market time again. They're building it at the moment. So so I narrated that this week. I've also been writing Beneath the Zoo, which I mentioned, which is uh, inspired by the demolition of Bristol Zoo, which is the biggest city near me. And when um, my parents, after my parents divorced, my dad used to come and take me and my brother for days out. And children of divorced parents or divorced people with children will understand this, uh, where you go and you only see your kids for a couple of hours. And uh, my dad used to take us to Bristol Zoo. So, and now it's being demolished and they're building uh, homes there. So I, I this has been bound up with a lot of emotions for me. I wrote about some of that in writing The Shadow and I wanted to distill this sort of emotion into a short story. So uh, I've been writing that. I've also been prepping my shadow sessions live, which are coming up for those who backed the uh, those levels for the webinar. Sorry, for writing The Shadow. I've also been writing my 15-year pivot solo show coming up and an article on how generative AI search will change book discovery. It's been a busy week. I'm working on all kinds of things that I want to get done in the next two weeks. Just a reminder, if you backed my Writing the Shadow Kickstarter, you should have any digital files by now. Many of you also have the printed books, which is very exciting. Any issues, please message me through Kickstarter or email me joanna at thecreativepen.com. I am still missing uh, a couple of people with no addresses. So if you don't have your book by the middle of December, please email me. And maybe you didn't give me your address. <laughs> so thanks for your emails and comments. Thanks to Rob, who was in Naples last week, came across a mosaic in the Pompeii Archaeological Museum titled Memento Mori. And I thought of you. Thank you so much, Rob. They sent me a lovely skull mosaic picture. I love that. And Naples. Naples is a crazy city, that's for sure. <laughs> And on Patrick's interview on a second career as an author, uh, author J.D. Nichols said, great interview, perfect timing. I'm fleshing out a potential small town detective series for next year. And Angela said on Patrick's interview, I'm so glad you chose this topic. As many times when we retire, our family, friends and even we place our lives in a state of game over, even when we know we have so much more to give. I'm starting a career of, uh, as a writer after retiring on disability, knowing I want to do more than just sit at home twiddling my thumbs while improving my health. Writing has become a catalyst to a wonderful life. Thanks to Patrick sharing his experience, I have a renewed sense that life can continue to be fulfilling even after retiring or changing from a prior career. That is lovely. Thank you, Angela. I'm so glad you reflected on that. And yes, I mean, this is my second career. I was a um, IT consultant implementing SAP software for the first 13 years of my professional life. And I guess I'm coming up... <laughs> I'm coming up on 13 years full time next year, um, but 15 years in total. There was a bit of an overlap. So, yeah, I, I definitely think it'll be interesting to see if I do a, a third third phase, <laughs> as many people do. But yes, I'm glad that helped. Also, just a couple of things. Deborah said, I was impressed when you said you couldn't imagine early in your career signing all those Kickstarter books. I'm where you were then. So it's inspirational. And yeah, I wanted to comment on this because... 
when you start out, you literally can't imagine where this career is going to take you. And maybe that applies to Angela's comment as well in that when you start another career, think about how it was when you started whatever career you're in, in terms of a day job. I mean, in that first year, you are not very good. (laughs) You don't get paid much. You're learning all the time. You're at the bottom of the ladder. And then inevitably, the more years you spend in a career, the more you learn, the more valuable you become uh, to the company or to yourself if you're running your own company and over the years things change and you pivot and you do stuff and but I just don't think anyone can imagine how things are going to be properly in the future so yeah signing all the kickstarter books is really a big deal for me and also thanks to Claire who said uh, around writing the shadow I can't tell you how important I found seeing you get such a long-term project into the world something which has cooked in your brain for years you recognized you weren't ready to do it yet and then you actually did it well done and uh, also wanted to comment on that because yeah Those of you who've been listening, probably for a decade, I have been talking about the shadow book. And that's another part of that long term thinking with Morgan Housel. I certainly feel that writing the shadow is one of the most important books that I've written. Um, I was only really able to write it after doing pilgrimage, which I consider important in many ways. But I also feel like that is quite a self-contained thing. Whereas writing the shadow to me is almost the I don't want to say the pinnacle because there's always a new pinnacle. But right now I feel like it is it encapsulates a lot of what I've wanted and tried to say for many, many years. So, yeah, if there are projects where you think, OK, this I am not ready for this yet. Don't worry. Hopefully there will be time to write it. So, yes, please leave a comment on the podcast show notes at thecreativepen.com or on the YouTube channel or email me, send me pictures of where you're listening, uh, joanna at thecreativepen.com. I love to hear from you. It makes this more of a conversation. But please don't message me on social media as I am almost entirely off it now which is a relief and something I'll talk more about when I do my 15 year pivot thing. I'm still trying to consider how social media plays any part in my life. Um, But yeah, I feel quite happy for mostly being off it right now. (laughs) Right. This episode is sponsored by Ingram Spark. I use Ingram Spark to print and distribute my self published print books wide because Ingram Spark helps me share my story with the world. And just to be clear, I use KDP Print for Amazon, Ingram Spark for bookstores, libraries, universities, etc., and Book Vault for my Shopify stores and my Kickstarters. All of these reach readers in different markets. So why even consider Ingram Spark? Well, if you only use KDP Print, then bookstores, libraries, universities, print-on-demand sites in many countries will not even consider your book because you need to offer a discount and also you need to be in the catalogues that they order from. Plus, a lot of these places will not order from Amazon for obvious reasons. If you care about getting your books into these places, you need to go wide with your print books. Now, remember, this is not about ebooks or KU or exclusivity, since even if you are exclusive with ebooks, you can still do print with Ingram Spark. They now offer an ultra premium colour option ideal for books that include images and graphics that would benefit from sharp, crisp contrast. Ultra premium books have offset printing colour quality using a toner printer. Also now available, ground wood paper, a lightweight, a lightweight, (laughs) thicker paper that's paired with mass market and trade content. You will have access to over 40,000 retailers, independent bookstores, libraries, schools and universities, chain bookstores and more across a global network of distributors. Of course, it means your book will be available to order in places like Foils and Blackwells in Waterstones in the UK, uh, Booktopia in Australia and New Zealand, Chapters Indigo in Canada, Walmart, Target and independent stores in the USA. It will be available to order, but you still have to drive demand. But since having my books on Ingram Spark, I have sold books in many of those places and including universities, which I, I feel quite awesome about. So you can choose to use returns, but it's not necessary. And I do not use returns. You can also choose your discount percentage. You can bulk order, for example, if you want back of the room copies for live events, or if you work direct with schools or bookstores, you can just ship direct. And they have printing plants in Australia, as well as the US and Europe, which really helps. The best part, Ingram now has free book set up for print or ebooks and offers free revisions on your book in the first 60 days. 
So what are you waiting for? Share your story with the world and head over to ingramspark.com. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing, but my time in creating the show and my continued enthusiasm for the podcast is sponsored by my community at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. As a patron, you get access to the monthly Q&A, which I did last week, which was kind of a solo extra show of around 50 minutes, 45 to 50 minutes. And of course, you get access to the backlist. There are also videos behind the scenes on AI tools. There's one coming this week on cover design with Midjourney and Firefly, as well as an end-to-end process of using AI tools for for the zoo short story that's coming this month, plus using AI tools for email, behind the scenes on Shopify, much more to come as I turn my Patreon hub into a really useful resource for authors. It's now a monthly subscription, the equivalent to a black coffee a month or a couple of flat whites, if you're feeling generous. <laughs> so you get, um, so if you feel you get value from the podcast and you want more, come on over and join more than 800 authors now in the community. Thanks to everyone who's been supporting the show for years and months. You're amazing. Thanks to new patrons this week, Shannon, Nigel, Arjade or Arjade, Jay Ryan, Lindsay, Junetta, Dan and Joanne. You can join the community and receive lots of extra information and inspiration as well as supporting the show at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, let's get into the interview. Michael Evans is the author of science fiction thrillers as well as subscriptions for authors and the creator economy. He's also the co-founder of Ream, a subscription platform that helps authors create a thriving paid membership for their readers. So welcome to the show, Michael. Thank you for having me. So wild, but really cool to be on this end of the mic. Been listening to you for since the beginning. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Well, thank you so much for coming on. So first up, tell us a bit more about you and how you got into writing and publishing. Yeah, well... Like everyone, writing's been, well, I shouldn't say everyone, but it's been an instinct for me since the youngest age where I've just loved storytelling, mainly through fan fiction. I didn't realize I was writing fan fiction at the time because I was writing it in journals and I was in, a little insecure about my writing. It was my my journal, but I didn't start to think of myself as an author. I didn't start to actually start to write my own worlds and stories until I got into middle school. My parents had gotten divorced. And for me, just coping with what was a very disruptive time in my life uh, was was writing. It was my escape. And I had simultaneously become super passionate about technology in the future, but also disillusioned with it uh, and kind of felt like the answer to creating a better world wasn't just creating new technologies, but was instead like trying to figure out what is actually best for people. And that's where stories came in. So I started writing and I wrote for two years between 13 and 15, which is very seriously, religiously, and had kind of written two books by the end of that, but didn't like even think of it like in terms of publishing. That wasn't even a thought of mine. It was just for fun. But when I got to the end of the second book, I was like, maybe I could get this out in the world. And my mom, she was like, let's see what, let's see what's even possible. And she like looked up like self-publishing and basically your name came up. So (laughs) she actually bought your book and gave it to me and I read it. And then we discovered the Sterling and Stone guys and that they were great. And just that kind of got me into the world of like, oh, okay, I can do this. And then basically in high school, I was like, okay, I'm going to work a part-time job during school. I'm going to save up all my money. My mom, normally I would have had to spend money on getting a car and things like that. But my mom was like, I'll drive you to work. She was like the most supportive person ever and like love my mom. So she's like, okay, I'll drive you to work. You can have this job so you can save up all of your money. And I was like, okay. So I did that, worked as a pool tenant resort and just put all of it into editing, Carter's eye. We all know the expenses that come with being an author. And I published my first book going into my sophomore year of high school. And I guess I caught the bug. I fell in love not only with obviously writing itself, but also the business of writing. And I caught the idea that maybe I could be a full-time author. That actual adventure, I cannot even dive into full detail right now. But over the next three years, I ended up publishing 12 books. I ended up like getting super deep into KU, Facebook ads, Amazon ads, learning a lot about different areas of the publishing ecosystem. Then I went to YouTube 
Then I went to live streaming right when I got to college. And that was another adventure. We did a road trip around the country. I was a creator partner with a startup that was founded by Sean Parker called Airtime, who's the first president of Facebook. And that started to connect my mind on a few things. One, I'd always loved YouTube. Specifically, Hank and John Green were some of the people who made me feel like I could write a book. And for those who don't know Hank and John Green, they're awesome. So <laughs> them, yeah, they are fantastic. <laughs> they are fantastic. And then finally, when I got to YouTube, got into live streaming, I started to see like what other areas of the creator economy, which I know we'll revisit that word, were doing. And I just felt like there was so many different areas that authors could move into with direct sales, building community, different different product lines in terms of merch and that in a way we just needed the tools to help us do that. So then I got super passionate about building technology that could actually help a community of people that I, I loved and cared about was a part of, which was indie authors and specifically fiction authors. And then about a year and a half ago, started Ream with Amelia and Sean. But that's how I got my start in all of this. And it's been an incredible adventure. And I feel like the luckiest guy in the world to be able to just do what I love. That's, that's what it's all about. <laughs> and what I appreciate about you, we met in person in Austin, wasn't it? The it creator was, I think economy. it was Phoenix. Uh, Phoenix. Technically, oh, Phoenix. I think Scottsdale, somewhere around Phoenix. Yeah, yeah somewhere. Okay. It was, it was last year or something. But you don't seem to hesitate when it comes to jumping into things. And you experiment and you try stuff mm -hmm. and you have a go. So I did want to ask you about that. And because I'm sure some people listening are like, how has this dude done all these different things? Also, given that you learned about self-publishing from me while you were still in school, <laughs> which kind of makes me feel old. But in terms of this attitude to jumping in and trying things, is that something you've always had? And can you give any tips to people listening who are like, well, how do I get the courage to jump into trying something if I've never done it before? Totally. I mean, for me, I definitely have an aptitude for risk taking. Like I love, I love it. Like the adrenaline of like, trying something new, seeing if it work out, going all in. That's like what I love. I love taking risks. So that's just me. That's where the author entrepreneur comes out, especially the preneur part. And not everyone has the same risk tolerance. Not everyone has the ability to take the same risk, but we all have 24 hours in a day. We all have the resources we have to do things and we all hopefully have some goals and dreams that we want to work towards. And what's always been most helpful to me is keeping the long-term vision in mind. And whenever I've struggled is when I've swayed away from that. I definitely like high futuristic type of person. So, and I, th I think we relate on that, Joanna, but mm. <laughs> <laughs> what I always would mess up on, like in my dark moments, because I obviously did like the movie trailer version of my life there were some really dark moments and in, in self-publishing specifically when I was running Facebook and Amazon ads, I would say there was a moment where like my going all in on things was a huge detriment because I started spending a lot of money on Facebook ads before I really validated the read through of my books. So I was kind of like, I would say like, quote unquote gambling on a certain read through calculation, which for those who don't know what read through is, read through is the idea that if one reader comes in and reads book one, maybe you're selling it for like $5. So then you get maybe $3.50 in royalties if you're on a retailer, roughly that. Read through is the idea of if you're writing in a series, or even if you have multiple books under a pen name, that when you spend money on ads to acquire a reader and bring them into selling a book, they're also going to read more of your books. Therefore, you could technically advertise book one at a loss and still make money over the next few months. Now, I say technically because... That didn't happen for me. I didn't have a high enough read through. And that was something that I should have spent more time actually slowing up, reading more of my subgenres and reflecting more on where I wanted to be, the long-term vision. But I was super caught up in how can I get to a thousand dollars a month on Amazon like yesterday? How can I get to ten thousand dollars a month ASAP, which I never hit ten thousand dollars a month? I think my biggest month was like thirteen or fourteen hundred dollars and I spent like eleven hundred dollars in ads. So I'm being open about the numbers just to say, you know. It, it was hard for me and I actually made a lot of mistakes. And if I could go back, yes, my all in nature is really great. I think a lot of us as creative people have that. We like jump into the new story and this is going to become everything. But I do wish I slowed down and kept the long-term vision in mind because you don't have to make it in a month as an author. In fact, you're probably not. That, that, that That's just the truth. It's a tough industry. But over the course of years, if you can stay consistent, stay in the game and keep improving your craft, improving your skills, you're going to go somewhere awesome. 
And I, unfortunately, because of this stressful process I put myself through, burned myself out. And I think, if anything, the only positive thing is that I came out of it with some lessons about myself and a willingness to try and make a change in the community to help authors pursue a more sustainable path in publishing, which is what I think subscriptions, a lot of it goes back to. It's interesting. You you talk there about some of the mistakes you've made, but just two set of scene. I tell people how old you are now so they know how long you've been doing this. Yeah, I'm 21 now and I published my first book a little over six years ago. So I'd say I've been in the CUNY really serious about any publishing for now about seven years. Yes. Yeah, so, and I love this about you because I do talk about, and many people talk about this, there's your actual age and then there's your writing craft age and then there's your business age. And I think the problem that some people think is that, for example, I know some authors who have a really high writing craft age, as in they've been writing books for a really, really long time, but their business age is zero, as in they have no experience with business or trying things. And even though you're younger in the physical age, you have six, seven years worth of writing craft and also business. So I don't want you to think those failures were a bad thing. They were a really good thing. (laughs) Because I mean, by the time you've done this for another decade, you will have learned so much even more. So I just want people to realise this, that we all have these different ages, physical ages, craft ages, business ages. And uh, you've had a number of businesses already. So I mean, you're getting through your lessons, which I think is good. (laughs) Yes, I've always had a habit of, I guess, uh, maybe speed running through life at times. Yeah, (laughs) But I totally agree. We all have different paths. And we're at different places and different points. And I hope what people take from my story is just that it takes a while. And I, I sometimes I see at least this was a weakness in myself, being a little impatient, And if you're anything like me and you're hard on yourself, you want to push yourself and you also kind of want to make this happen on a soon time period, I would just tell you that things age with time in a good way and that it doesn't have to all happen overnight. It probably won't, but that doesn't mean that even if it's not going the way you want it to right now, that you're not improving and that you're not getting a step closer, even if it doesn't feel like it. That's one of the tough parts about this industry, but it's also one of the really exciting things when you learn to fall in love with it. Indeed. Okay. So you mentioned subscriptions and that um, you're one of the three co-founders of Ream. So tell us, I guess, what Ream is and also what subscriptions are. Yeah. I'll start with what subscriptions are and then tell you how Ream can help authors actually make money from subscriptions. So Subscriptions in short, there's a lot of different subscriptions in our life. So when I say that word, it's like, oh, what what am I subscribing to? In the context of what I'm going to be talking about today, subscriptions are a recurring payment, could be monthly, could be annual, that a reader makes directly to you as an author. So a subscription to an individual author. It's not like an all-in-one subscription program like we see with something like a Kobo Plus or a KU. And what the reader gets in exchange for that subscription varies. You get to pick that as the author. You even get to pick your price. But some common things we see are early access to new books before they're released elsewhere, access to backlist, maybe access to some bonus content, character profiles, world building maps. We see community events, authors doing live streams, book clubs. We see merchandise. We see signed books, book boxes, I'm now overwhelming you. The point is your subscription can be what you make of it in a really fun way. And I always like to say the best subscriptions are at the intersection of what do your readers want, which genre plays a role in it, your relationship to your readers play a role in it. What do you want? What are you good at? And what are you able to do right now with the time that you have, which I'm sure we'll talk a bit more about that. But that's subscriptions in short. Ream is a platform specifically for fiction authors to run their subscription. So People have probably heard of other subscription platforms, and Ream is really just the new age one that's specific to fiction authors. And what makes Ream special is we have an e-reader, so readers can actually read your books inside the platform and comment inside the books to help build a CUNY. We have text messages inside of stories. You can have pen names on Ream, so you can have multiple accounts or multiple pages, I should say, from one account. We have a whole separate CUNY section where you are able to make posts, art, 
other sorts of benefits you want to give your readers. You can accept addresses on Ream and send them signed books. So it's really like an all-in-one subscription platform where all those business models that I just shared, you can run on Ream. And we help you save a lot of time in doing it because we have a number of scheduling features that just make it so easy to manage your Ream and your subscription. And we also are constantly working with our authors uh, to make the platform better. And that's Ream in in short. You mentioned there that you have an e-reader. To me, in my language, that means you have a device. You don't mean you have a device. You have an app. That's actually a good uh, clarification. So we have an e-reader app where you can load up your books, publish them, and your reader is able to comment actually inside of the stories as well. Um, And you get to moderate that as an author, if you choose. So yes, it's an app, other kind of subscription platforms, like if authors try and have it on their own site or elsewhere, it's much tougher to load in early access content and bonus content and have it be an actual friendly experience to the reader because they don't necessarily allow publishing books. And that's what we're built around. We're built around stories. We're built for and by fiction authors. Okay, yes, because I mean, I've been using Patreon since like 2014, I think. And nowadays, it's a kind of uh, a community for this podcast, and I share business stuff. But I've never done fiction as part of a subscription. And I wouldn't because I don't do uh, regular enough fiction. I mean, basically, I only publish a couple of fiction things a year. Um, so from what you've seen, like what types of authors do well on Ream and other fiction subscription platforms? Yeah, no, great question. I think there's a few archetypes. One archetype is the one that probably most people think about first for two reasons. One, because it's probably the biggest right now in subscriptions. And two, actually, Amelia Rose, who co-founded Ream with me and Sean, Sean's Amelia's husband, and he's our CTO and software engineer who's really building the platform. So Amelia, she was making six figures a year in her subscription, and she was running it using a different platform that really just didn't work for her. It actually was clunky for her readers. She was seeing higher churn, and she also was spending a lot more time managing it, and they were even censoring her content. She's a steamy romance author. So when me and Amelia met, I was like, wow. I had I had been in the industry, I guess, at that point for five plus years, because this was about a year and a half ago. And I was like, I haven't really seen an author, a fiction author succeeding with a subscription model, right? I was used to people like podcasts doing it. I was used to seeing YouTubers do it. So this wasn't like a new thing to me, but it was new that like a fiction author was succeeding in it. So I was just so fascinated. So when I talked to her and got to learn from her, her model is mostly based around early access. What that means is that she gives her chapters to people who are paying inside her subscription early before they release on other retailers. So an example is she might release two chapters of book one to her subscription in January. By March, that book's released fully in her subscription and she'll release it out to the public maybe in April or May for people to buy a la carte on retailers. Now, this model of early access is very popular from authors who come from serial fiction platforms. So Amelia Rose actually kind of gained a lot of her audience. Now she's everywhere, but initially she started off on Wattpad. That's how she gained her audience. Wattpad's changed a lot in the years since then, but that was a great place for her to start at the time. And that was her only way to monetize at the time because she was posting her work for free on Wattpad, then paywalling the early access in her subscription. So that is still a very common model we see authors do. Um, A lot of Royal Road authors who are publishing, especially like Progression Fantasy, Lit RPG, they're very successful in this model. We indexed a list recently, roughly $20 million plus dollars are made by fiction authors' subscriptions. So it's a niche market, but definitely it's a thing. And the Lit RPG authors are huge on that list. Like they dominate it, right? But then there's a lot of romance authors coming from these serial fiction platforms. Think a Radish. Think if you are familiar with Kindle Vela, similar type of models, but that's kind of what it's like. But that's not the only type of authors being successful in it. So we see other kinds of authors. We see authors like a Kay Webster, who's very big on book boxes. So that, that's what she's doing. We see authors like Jack Steen or David Vergutz, both are horror authors. Their subscriptions are mostly based around short stories, which horror has a long tradition of short stories and they're difficult to monetize. Actually, subscriptions makes it a great format for it. One short story a month, $3, think of that type of thing. And we also see authors like Elena Johnson, who she's not coming from retailers. Uh, Those who know Elena Johnson, she's 
incredible. She's coming, uh, she's sorry, she's not coming from serial fiction platforms. She's coming from retailers. That's where most of her audience is. She sells direct now too. But when she started her subscription, the idea was not necessarily just based around early access of the next serialized story. It was giving her readers a specific, a very specific storyline that was within an existing world that she had, I think a cowboy romance. And her readers really wanted that and were willing to basically get that like bonus content. And she'll probably roll it out of her subscription eventually. So anyways, I'm definitely at the point where I've ranted, but there's a lot <laughs> of awesome opportunities and subscriptions and there's a lot of different models. It really just depends on that intersection of what do you want to do? What are you able to do? How much time do you have to put into it? I recommend bootstrapping your subscription in every sense of the word. Like you shouldn't be spending 40 hours in your subscription when you have a lot of other things in your publishing business, unless it's making you enough money to warrant that. So you can put more in over time in that way. And then of course, what do your readers want? And the best way to test what your readers want is to get started and to try one thing, one benefit at a time and see what the response of your readers is. Mm -hmm. That's some big high level advice in tandem with the archetypes. And yeah, we see authors in a lot of different genres being successful. Romance and literary RPG are definitely the two biggest. We see horror picking up fantasy and science fiction for sure. Thrillers, I've been surprised. There's more coming in thrillers, but not as much in thrillers right now. Cozy Mystery, I would say has more than thrillers, which is interesting. Cozy Mystery has people like Tonya Capps doing really well, um, et cetera. So yeah, that that's kind of like a genre market map of subscriptions. But I would say that genre doesn't entirely correlate to success. It's more based on your relationship with your readers, the specific model you're running. There's quite a few more variables than just what's your genre. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So I, I find this interesting. I mean, you've mentioned Wattpad, Vela, Radish, uh, Royal Road. These are some other subscription sites. But what uh, Not you... subscription sites, serial fiction platforms. Serial so they're fiction. Kind of using yeah. them, authors will use them kind of as a funnel into their subscription site because on these platforms, you have very limited control of your audience. You don't get their emails. You don't have the payment data. And if you're using a platform like Ream, it's based around direct sales. You get all the emails of your subscribers. You can control the payment data. And also a lot of these platforms are under monetized, like a Wattpad. It's very hard to make money on unless you're like in their contract paid program. So authors will utilize a subscription to actually make some income from their work. So subscriptions are kind of like a home for your readers. And depending on what other platforms you use, authors are kind of funneling their readers into their subscription and giving them this special VIP access. You could kind of think about it like a VIP club. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, that's how I'm treating my Patreon as well. So if there are any nonfiction authors still listening, <laughs> then there are other ways to do it for nonfiction. But but coming back to this idea of, of selling direct, and obviously you talk about the creator economy too, I, I do as well, in that selling direct is so important, having our customer data, getting access to the money, and that's what you're doing with Ream. But what is difficult for many authors, especially those who have been around as long as I have, and who have pretty Pretty much used Amazon, Apple, Kobo, the kind of dominant ways of doing business, is that people find it very hard to shift their mindset away from a big retailer centric model. And the biggest question I get asked, even around things like Kickstarter and Shopify, is but how do I get people to buy from me direct, whether that is buying on Kickstarter or Shopify or subscribing to a Patreon or a Ream or whatever. So how do you advise authors to do their marketing and encourage readers to move over to these sort of models? I have a two-part answer. The first part is more general mindset. The second part is actually some more practical advice about how you can apply that mindset and maybe structure some marketing campaigns to do that. So the first thing, the mindset, I want to be very clear. I, and I think every, I think of most people who talk about direct sales and the importance of it would agree. No one's saying to abandon the retailers. No one's saying to completely abandon them and go direct. You can do that. And there's nothing wrong with that, but there's a discovery benefit you get from these platforms, right? That can be beneficial. So I'm not saying abandon them entirely. This whole new ecosystem of publishing is going to take literally like a decade plus to play out. So in the short run, that's not a great idea. I have futurist ideas about where publishing is really going in like 10 years, but that's more wishes and desires and not relevant right now. So if you want to do something like subscriptions, because I'll be honest, I... I know Kickstarter. I know direct sales a bit, but I'm no expert. I, I wouldn't even call myself a subscription expert, but I know a little bit more about it. 
And when it comes to subscriptions, one of the things I like to share with authors is that when you're priced on a retailer, right? Everyone gets the same experience. Everyone pays the same. And that's great for a lot of your audience who just wants the standard experience. But what about for those fans who want more and also who are willing to pay more, who have a higher willingness to pay? That's going to be a smaller portion of your audience. I'm not saying that if you have a thousand sales on Amazon, you're magically getting at a thousand paid subscribers. That is a ridiculous conversion rate. We see a little bit more like a mailing list, right? If you're able to get like anywhere from like one to 5% of a mailing list to convert, that's great. Why that's a big range is because mailing lists can vary in quality. A mailing list of, let's say, people who came in through the back of the book and already bought your book, yeah, that that might be closer to a 5% conversion rate down the line. Whereas if it's from cross promos and things of that nature, nothing wrong with that, but that'll obviously be a lower conversion rate to subscriptions. What does that mean? Because I'm being candid about numbers. I'm not trying to promise everyone all of their audience moving over to subscription platform that's paid overnight. But what I am saying is that if you have a certain percentage of your audience who's paying you extra per month, three, five dollars a month, that can make a big difference to you as an author. And it doesn't have to eat away at the retailers because you're providing them kind of a different level of service, right? You're giving them that behind the scenes. You're giving them that early access, whatever it is that they want. They just get the opportunity to support you, to know that they have what's called reciprocity, where they've gotten so much value for your books, but they can only pay you so much in a retailer. Now they want to give that back. So there's all these different psychological phenomenons that come in. And the whole thing is that you are not your readers as an author. So you being able to try something like this, knowing that there's no exclusivity agreements, knowing that you can run it the way you want, there's little to lose, especially because I'm not asking anyone and no one should be spending $1,000 to launch their subscription. You can launch your subscription for free. And as you make money, invest more into it, keep that money, invest it into the rest of your business. So that's one mindset shift. But the second thing, actually being practical because, okay, Michael, great. You're telling me there's an opportunity there that might work for me. Fine. And that, sure, I understand that I can diversify my revenue streams. I understand that controlling my customers is important. We get that. A lot of people have said that, but how can I actually do that? Well, for subscriptions, I found three things to be really effective in actually bringing people over. So the toughest thing I find for authors is we have so many, we only have so much marketing energy. We only have so much. And when I tell you, you have to manage a subscription, that's one thing. Oh, okay, I have to post the content there. Okay, I have to set that up. That takes time right? But you also have to market it. And that also takes time and it can be worth it, but we have to make it worth it. So how can we leverage your marketing time really well? And we're going to use a lot of the same psychological tactics that retailers already do for us. And because retailers already do these things for us, we don't have to think about them as authors, but when we're selling direct, we do have to think about these things. So what are they? One is making something available for a limited time. How do you do this in subscription? when a subscription is supposed to be always open. Well, I'll give you an example. Kat T. Mason, she launched on Ream, I think in September, and she was doing an early access-based subscription, and she's an author who does very well in retail. She's a romance author. And when we were talking, I was like, you should launch your subscription for like a couple weeks and then close it off so that readers have a time pressure to get in. And you don't need to be working, worrying about marketing at all 12 months of the year, right? You can just send out an email or two in that one month and use that sort of time pressure to get people in. And she was able to get over 100 paid members in her first launch. So it went pretty well for her. Now, obviously, she has a larger audience. And if you don't have a pre-existing audience, I'm definitely not promising you that you'll get 100 members overnight. But it's a strategy that worked. What is another strategy? So that's limited time. Another one is discounts. We see this all the time in subscriptions. The discount is the free trial, right? Literally, if you go on to Kobo Plus or you go on to Kindle Unlimited, how they get people into their subscription is offering people a free trial. So you can do discounts and promotions and things of that nature that are also maybe limited time and to get people in, right? So that they are paying monthly. That's another way to do it. We see this all the time in direct sales. So subscriptions are like an aspect of direct sales, but if you're doing a la carte sales, we see this a lot of time with bundles, right? Bundles is basically playing on the same psychology of giving someone a a, a discount, a deal to kind of move over and have a little bit more friction and moving into a newer ecosystem. So if you ever want to do a discount or promotion code like that, not every subscription platform offers things like this, but if you're on Ream, you just reach out to our team and we can create it for you. The last thing I see is exclusive content. This is what YouTubers, I think, utilize the best, like expertly, expertly. But Basically, it's creating something that's only available to this specific audience. So maybe it's a special edition cover, 
Katie Roberts famous for this and has a very big subscription doing this. Maybe it's limited time merch, like a merch drop. This is what YouTubers, I, I think, at least growing up, made most of their money off of. They were la- launching these limited time merch lines that you can only buy, let's say, for a couple weeks. You could literally do that as an author, but analogies like that, like that could be a special edition cover. It could be a few short stories that are only available in your subscription. Exclusivity is something people will pay for and that'll help them get them over the edge. So these are things that are just in addition to like the standard marketing of, sure, you can share your link. Sure, you could do that. And I could give you that advice and like, that's fine. Like, oh yeah, if you have your subscription, just launch it and see what readers think. Yeah, that can work really, really well. But obviously I know that can be frustrating for some authors who've tried that and are like, this is draining for me or this isn't sustainable. So I hope those like the mindset and then those three tips actually give you some really actionable advice about mm. launching and bringing people into subscription. Yeah, that's great. And I mean, again, it's interesting how there's just different variants of direct sales. And I mean, Kickstarter also taps into that exclusive short period, the exclusive merchandise or the exclusive types of books. And what I think I found difficult over the years is that people would use the idea of fake scarcity around exclusivity and they'd be like you can only get this book here and then it would be somewhere yeah. else but with kickstarter with the limited time subscriptions if you do exclusivity like you can actually do real scarcity so my gold foil hardback that i'm doing for this kickstarter that by the time this goes out is well well over <laughs> but it, it i feel happy that i can market with real scarcity now. Whereas before I never wanted to do that because I wasn't scarce. And also on, again, coming back to the nonfiction side, I decided to really double down on the subscription for Patreon because I was getting so much negativity from a wider community. And so I wanted to put a whole load of exclusive stuff, including a lot more about AI behind the paywall, even if it's a very small paywall. So that might be another tip for people is if you want to create things specifically for a community who want to hear what you're saying, rather than a broader, everything is free community, then that can be another draw I think. And I mean, that may be, you mentioned the more steamy writing. (laughs) It could be that that's something that some people want, or I don't know, lots of other things. But I feel like the exclusive idea, the scarce idea, these all definitely work. I also just wanted to comment, I just did my numbers while you were talking. You mentioned between one and 5% of an audience. And I did my numbers. So 4% of my podcast audience subscribe to my Patreon. So I guess that's that's very good. Oh, good. (laughs) I thought I'd uh, share that number. (laughs) That's amazing. I mean, just a testament to how literally you have the best podcasts and self-publishing. No offense to anyone else. I I love Ah, other podcasts, but (laughs) you're amazing. And that, that is a really, that's very good. (laughs) That, that's like actually super impressive, especially like at your size too. So ultimate congrats on that. But, but yeah, that's, that's it. Right. And I think I've already like, having to hold back excitement because when you say things like scarcity and then like it being authentic scarcity, I immediately think about trust and then like trustless technology systems and how you build trust with that. But that's like a whole other, we can go on a tangent, uh, me and Joanna at 20 books about that. But when it comes to actually building trust, because I wanted to highlight that, that is ultimately the core of an author business. And if there's anything I want people to take away from this podcast today, if there is one thing, I don't think every author should have a subscription, which is totally a weird thing to say as a guy who's no, no, CEO I totally agree. Yeah, for but sure. There's, there's no way. Like, mm. there's that just doesn't make sense. But for people who it's right for, it can be very, very good. But I will tell you, there's something we can all learn from subscriptions, which is that subscription marketing. And there's a great book by Ann Janser, who's an awesome nonfiction author, by the way. And I'm going to recommend the book. It's called Subscription Marketing. It's all about how subscription marketing is really about retention. That's the core of what subscription marketing is. The word we like to use in the author community, which I've already used in this podcast, is read-through rate, right? Are readers coming back for your books? Obviously, the biggest way to build trust with readers is writing amazing stories that meet their expectations that you put on the packaging of it, whether you're packaging it in a tier, whether you're packaging it in a book description, et cetera. I mean, that fundamental of the business I don't see necessarily going anywhere, even as we have all these technology and platform changes. However you package it up, however you monetize it, someone needs to get what they expected from it, and hopefully even more, and want to come back to keep continuing to get more. That is huge. That is the core of subscription marketing. And sometimes I think in the author community, we can get very caught up in finding the new, finding the new. How can we bring more people in? How can we increase our audience? And that's such a 
pressing problem for so many of us because we might have smaller audiences. But don't be so focused on the new that you forget about your existing readers and serving them and focusing on that retention. That's a very important part of the equation. And that is how you'll build a long lasting business in publishing. And the ways that you can build trust are by sticking to your word, under promising and over delivering. That's probably the biggest one, the biggest one. And it's by doing things that kind of meet your why, that align with your mission, that align with your values and and not compromising that. That builds trust in people, that builds a tribe around you. Yeah, and absolutely. And the principle of know, like, and trust is something that I've had schooled into me from day one. And it, I've definitely built my business on that. Now, we are almost out of time. And you have mentioned uh, a couple of times the sort of futurist aspect, the decade of transformation it's going to take for direct sales. And also, you kind of hinted at decentralized technology. Uh, for me, that kind of means blockchain and some interesting stuff there. So I do want to ask you about that because I was just thinking, so you're 21. When I was 20, 21, Amazon had just launched. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah, it was. So I was 21 in 1996. Amazon launched in 1995. I did not buy shares in Amazon back then. <laughs> I did make up for that later. But it is so interesting to think that we just don't know. And of course, there were a ton of companies around in 1996 that then went completely bust in the dot com crash. And there's a whole load of things that will change in the next, let's say, in the next 21 years, how much is going to yeah. change. So given that you are a generation who grew up completely differently to me, so we didn't have a smartphone in 1996. <laughs> We didn't have the, the internet like we do now. Um, There's so much we didn't have um, and there's so much opportunity. So I know this is difficult, but what do you see coming? What do you hope is coming? I love this question. I mean, it's an impossible question to answer, but that's why I love it. And I'll just say very candidly, like, I have no idea. In all honesty, <laughs> None of I us have, do. <laughs> yeah, no idea. So don't take any of this as gospel, but maybe some predictions, some trends I see, maybe some things I hope for, honestly. And what do I hope for? Because I'm optimistic about the future. I might write, if you go look at the books I've written, they're kind of dark, dystopian, sci- sci-fi stuff. And I, I enjoy that. But I really write those things because I ultimately always come from a place of light and hope. How can we make the world better? And I do believe the world's going to be better for authors in 10 years from now, in 20 years from now than it is today. How will that look better? How will it be better for readers? Well, I think there's like three core trends, and then one big definition I want to share because I dropped a buzzword and didn't define it earlier, and I should define it. So I talk about creator economy. A lot of people talk about the creator economy, and everyone has their own definition. And my definition of it is this. The platform economy was like when we had these big monolithic platforms that controlled everything. And the creator economy is a shift away from that by empowering individual creators to own, lead, their own individual communities. And basically the foundations of this, because I see the creator economy as the future. I see it being e-commerce 3.0 of sorts and kind of where things are headed. What I see in that for authors is that one, owning the relationship to your readers becomes more and more important, owning that data. So I do see direct sales as a continuing trend um, and something that's going to become bigger in the future of publishing, direct sales, whether it's through subscriptions, whether it's through a la carte, whether it's through crowdfunding, all these are ways to do direct sales, right? I see that becoming more important, owning that customer data because Amazon ultimately, and I use Amazon and all the other retailers, owns the customer data and they built incredible businesses off the back of that customer data, right? Amazon literally turned books into the everything store. And I think it's time that authors have that same ability to using our customer data and empower ourselves to build stronger, better businesses. So that's one thing. I think in tandem with that, with like data ownership and direct sales, there is definitely a a Web3 aspect to it in terms of we're going to see that continue on even more. That's going to go somewhere crazy that I'm not even going to predict, but it's going to be very cool when we think about authenticity, trustless systems, digital scarcity, all of that is going to become, that's that's riding that direct sales wave. The other wave that I see, the other wave I see, and I'm going to mention these two letters because how could I talk about the future and not mention these two letters? is AI, specifically generative AI, because we've had lots of forms of artificial intelligence in the publishing world for a long time. When I think about generative AI, I see it as a little bit more of an enabling technology rather than a platform shift. I could be wrong, but I don't think it's going to completely disrupt how publishing's done, but I do think it's going to change maybe how things are created. And I think it's accelerating already existing trends that 
we have tons and tons of content now, tons and tons of content, a huge oversupply compared to the eyeballs. That is true regardless of AI, but I think these things can help speed these trends along in terms of authors recognizing it. But I also think it helps an even more important trend, which is if you're going to be running your own business, there's so much to do, right? There's so much to to actually do so many skills to have and having this sort of co-assistant, however you want to word it, that can be more accessible to people, I think will increase equity, inclusivity, and access in this industry. Now, I say that very well knowing the downsides, very well knowing that there could be a more dystopian future, but I have hope that this is where it'll go. And I believe it is, again, more of an enabling technology rather than disruptive for authors and enabling and empowering in a good way. I believe that but I don't personally build an AI technology. I'm not working on an AI company. I'm working on more of the direct sales and CUNY aspect, which I'll talk about that. The CUNY aspect, the third pillar of this. I see CUNY becoming more and more important. I'm going to recommend an essay and then I'm going to finally stop talking. There's an essay called The Loneliness Economy by Hugo Amsalon. It's awesome. It's all about how we're living in a world now where loneliness is basically one of the biggest social and actually public health problems. The world has changed drastically since the launch of Amazon, where we're now spending more time on our computers than we are with our friends and family combined. That is really wild. And what it's doing is it's bringing the rise of these, what I'll call third places. Hugo refers to this as well. And these third places are online digital CUNYs that become social and become homes for readers. And I would argue any content viewers online. This is something we see especially common with Gen Z and millennials. It's the big generational shift. 40% of Gen Z and millennials have met friends online. I've met most of my friends online. Most of my friends started online, which means that a lot of the friends that will be created in the future will be from people's shared passion for things like stories, like books. And those could be your books. How does that change the industry when readers are connecting with your works in a completely different way. I don't exactly know. Again, I'm kind of highlighting trends rather than giving concrete predictions, but it's going to be a big shift. And that's one of the things I'm most excited about is how do we empower that? How do we help readers who need this connection online more than ever? Because there's this big loneliness problem that has been kind of created out of this first era of the internet, The what we're up to now. So that, that's what I see in the future, those three trends. Mm. Well, I love to hear you mention hope and positivity and that you're feeling positive about the future for publishing and authors. Obviously, I feel the same. But my hope is also that people like yourself and your co-founders as young people in publishing, I mean, young techie people stay in publishing like that would be my hope i am so pleased that you're involved and that you've created this company with your co-founders and very exciting times so why don't you tell people where they can find you and reem and your books and everything you do online sure sure yeah so you can go to reem if you're interested in signing up you can create an account for free reem is pretty simple we just take a 10 percent of the revenue you make in the platform plus payment processing fees, pretty standard model for a subscription platform. So if, if you're interested in joining Ream, setting up there, you could go to Ream Stories, R-E-A-M Stories.com and, and sign up there. We have our CUNY of fiction authors mostly, but nonfiction is welcome too, at subscriptionsforauthors.com. Our Facebook group's the same name. Our podcast is the same name. And that's where you can find a lot of awesome information about just getting started subscriptions about the business model and meet some other awesome authors doing it. And I also have a free book called subscriptions for authors, which you will find on the subscriptions for authors.com website. Everything is there, but you can also find it for free on any retailer, anything of that nature. It's even free on YouTube. It's even free on Spotify, like anywhere you could basically put something for free in audio format. I it's free. So that's where I'd recommend getting started. And otherwise I'm not going anywhere. I want to see the world be better for authors. And I think that we have a role to play in it and that we all have a role to play in it. And I'm excited to push it forward with everyone and create a future where storytellers were the world. That's our mission. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time, Michael. That was great. Thank you so much for having me on. Literally a dream come true. And if anyone's new to this podcast, this is the right podcast to be listening to. Just keep listening to Joanne. So I hope you found the interview with Michael interesting and that it gave you some ideas around subscriptions for your business or just some hope for the future of publishing that energetic, business-minded creatives are building new things and are positive for what's coming next.
So if you are AI positive or AI curious, come and join me and Joseph Michael for a free AI writing webinar. You can join us live or get the replay. All the details at thecreativepen.com forward slash DEC5, short for December the 5th when the webinar is. If you're inside the community, I have a video coming this week to give you ideas around using Midjourney and Firefly for cover design and interior images. You can access everything at patreon.com forward slash the creative pen. Next week, I'm talking to Jane Dixon Smith about self publishing a cookery photo book. Jane is my cover designer and also does the interiors of my books. She's also a novelist, but this is her first cookery book and it is photo heavy. So lots to talk about there because, of course, my idea around my Gothic Cathedral books will be photo heavy. Lots to talk about there. So in the meantime, happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time. <laughs>